Good evening. My name is Kara Zwiebel, and I'm a lawyer and director of the Fundamental Freedoms Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. For those who don't know, the CCLA is an organization that has been working since 1964 to protect and promote rights and freedoms across Canada. And one of my core areas of focus at the CCLA is on freedom of expression. So I look at the topic of online speech through two lenses, uh, one that is focused on the overriding importance of freedom of expression as protected in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and one which is focused on efforts to try to reform the law uh, in order to try and address some of the harms that result from online speech, including most notably misinformation and hate. I believe that trying to regulate online expression in a way that complies with the Charter is one of the most significant and challenging contemporary constitutional issues. For at least the last six months, we have been hearing from the Government of Canada that they intend to table legislation to deal with online harms, although the date on which this legislation is coming seems to be a moving target. I have to admit that awaiting online harms legislation has upped my anxiety level, uh, which during the pandemic is really saying something. And that's because while I, I recognize that the free flowing expression that, that takes place online does give rise to real harms, it also has some very positive aspects as, as Tamara was just, uh, was just discussing. I'm very skeptical of the government's ability to regulate this space without overshooting the mark and undermining some of the genuine benefits that arise out of free expression online. Benefits that have included giving voices and in some cases, megaphones to those who are traditionally silenced or ignored. Um, and my skepticism isn't due to any distrust of this particular government or even distrust in government more generally. Um, rather, it's a skepticism about the use of exclusively legal tools to address complex social problems. So even if it were possible to scrub the internet of all hateful content, which, which I would say emphatically it, it's not, that would not change the fact that some people hate others because of the color of their skin or the person they love or the way that they pray. Clearly there's a role for the law to play, but I see it as a relatively limited one and I worry that if we pin all of our hopes and efforts on a new legal regime, we will inevitably be very disappointed with the results. There is still a lot we don't know about what the Government of Canada has planned in addressing online harms, but it seems likely that there will be a new regulator and that online platforms may be required to quickly remove pieces of content falling into certain categories. And the bits of intelligence that I have about what the government has planned suggest that the categories targeted will include non-consensual intimate images, the promotion of hatred, terrorist propaganda, child sexual exploitation material, and threats of violence. Uh, and the government may choose to follow in the footsteps of Germany, which has a 24-hour takedown requirement for some types of content, which means that platforms have to take down so-called obviously illegal content within 24 hours of receiving notice of it or face very substantial fines. So there's a few important points that I wanna make about this model. Um, first, although misinformation and disinformation arguably give rise to some of the most significant harms that we're seeing today, and I think that Timothy will, will talk about this, I, I don't believe the government will be attempting to address that particular category of expression with, with new legislation. Um, Canada used to have a spreading false news offense in the criminal code. But that law was struck down by the Supreme Court of Canada in the 1990s after it was used in an attempt to prosecute infamous Holocaust denier Ernst Sundel. Our defamation and libel laws can address some types of misinformation, but these generally depend on individuals bringing civil claims and will usually only be relevant where an individual or a corporation's reputation is involved. Second, a takedown model is a really concerning approach from the perspective of expressive freedom because it will almost certainly result in over removal of content. And that's because while it might be relatively easy to clearly identify an image of a child being sexually exploited, whether a particular piece of content is hate speech or even terrorist propaganda is much more difficult to determine. 
There's also a very big difference between how the law defines the promotion of hatred and what the average Canadian might consider to be hateful content. It, it surprises many people to know that in the last major Supreme Court case that dealt with a hate speech law, Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus Whatcott decided in 2013, the court made it quite clear that hate speech is not aimed at discouraging repugnant or offensive ideas, and that it doesn't prohibit expression which debates the merits of reducing the rights of vulnerable groups in society. And those are things that I think most people would typically categorize as hate speech. So to conclude, while I think the role, the, the law has some role to play, I think we need to focus more on efforts uh, on, on digital literacy, as uh, the other Kara mentioned. Um, I think we need to call for greater transparency and accountability from online platforms. And I think that we need to recognize the limits of the law when it comes to attempts to regulate expression uh, and, and assume some of the onus as users and consumers of information online to, to do our due diligence and put in the work necessary uh, to make the online environments that we engage in better and, and uh, less harmful. Thank you.